the overcome you Never over until it's over. One of the most exciting things about God I've found is His grace. He is not just a God of the first chance, He's a God of the second chance, a God of the third chance, a God of the fourth chance. In other words, uh, in God's eyes, He's always looking for ways to bring us in, not keep us aside. He is a God of another chance. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. That in Him, in Christ, our past and even our present does not have to determine our future. It can, but it doesn't have to. In other words, if we've come out of bad times, bad situations, or even if we're facing them right now, those two things don't have to determine the end of our story. They can come out the right way. Just because something starts bad doesn't mean it can't end up good. Uh, A number of years ago, I was in McDonald's having lunch, and uh, I was really concentrating on a bunch of things, and I I got up to go uh, to the restroom And without thinking, I went into the uh, women's restroom instead of the men's by mistake. Uh, So I've walked in and I've gone up this short hallway. Then I, I, then it started to, you know, like occur to me things were different. (laughs) Things were missing. There was no urinals. uh, It smelt better. uh, It it just wasn't the right scene. Then I realised that I'm in the women's toilet. Uh, Then I've gone into stealth mode. All right, because now I've got to get out without being seen. Uh, I'm checking that no doors are opening uh, in the toilets. I'm looking to the front door, hoping no one's going to come in. Uh, So it was a really bad situation. And as I'm creeping down the wall slowly and quietly to get out, uh, I'm thinking to myself, this is how your imagination works. I've imagined that the whole restaurant has seen me go in. So I'm thinking as I walk out the door, everybody's going to be clapping me, the staff have come out, you know, uh, and then I can imagine the headlines in the newspaper, uh, local pastor found in women's toilets at McDonald's. Uh, And so I'm sneaking out and then I finally get to the the main door and open it and and no one had seen me, everything was as per normal and usual. I stood out and breathed deeply, you know, like, ah. And then as I did that, I just noticed right to my right, a man standing right there looking at me. Uh, and, and this is what he says to me. He says, he was about to use the men's toilets. He was right there. And he looked at me and said, oh, thanks, mate. And I said, what do you mean? He says, I was about to go in the wrong one. So he went into the women's toilets. <laughs> and I certainly didn't stop him. Um, so even though they can start bad, they can end up good, you know. Uh, and so it's the same in life. Just because we have a bad start doesn't mean it has to be a lousy ending. Over and over again in the Bible, uh, there are classic accounts of people starting really badly and yet finishing up really well. Uh, I look at Moses who uh, started as a murderer, but at the end of his story, he was a deliverer. I look at the young man Joseph, who had a very dysfunctional family, threw him into a pit, he ended up being sold into slavery. He he went to jail for something he didn't do, but the end of the story is he became the prime minister of Egypt and saved his nation. I I think of Paul, who was the original anti-Christ. He was the man, uh, a Pharisee, that hated the Christian uh, belief, destroyed Christian followers. He he chained them, he persecuted persecuted them, he put them in chains, and he even killed Christians. But at the end of the story, he becomes the great apostle that writes most of the New Testament. And if anybody understood the power of God's grace and forgiveness, it was the apostle Paul. To be a person that destroyed and stood against uh, everything that Christ stood for, to kill believers, uh, it was a man that when he found Christ, really had a very clear picture of what grace really was. He understood the forgiveness uh, that God put in his heart. As a matter of fact, what happens when we get saved, the Bible says that God forgives all of our sins. He, he so not only forgives them, he forgets them so much that he casts them as far as the east is from the west and remembers them no more. Our dilemma is not that God remembers our sins. Our dilemma is that we remember our sins. We remember our past, our faith. We are determined by what has happened to us and what we're going through right now. And in Philippians 3 verse 13, we see Paul address this predicament. He says this, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But listen, 
the one thing I do. And it's not the only thing that he does, but what he's saying, this is so important. The one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind and I reach forward to those things that are ahead. In other words, for him to move into his destiny, he's got to allow God to deal with his sin, his failures, his mistakes, but not only God to deal with them, he's got to deal with them. He's got to forget them. He says, I forget those things. Man, I, 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 it's not as though he's lost his memory. He has made a decision not to be that person. See, once you're born again, you're a brand new creation, the Bible says. Everything changes. After repentance, God will not put my past to my account. I am a new man. You could have gone up to Saul and looked him in the eyes and said, aren't you, aren't you Saul, the Pharisee? Aren't you the one that, that, that stood against Jesus? Aren't you the one that, that persecuted those Christians? And he would look straight back in your eyes with total honesty and say, sorry, you've made a mistake. That was somebody else. That was somebody else. In other words, he'd so determined in his heart to live by that scripture. I will not remember those things. Why? Because if you remember the things that are behind, it traps you into your past and stops you from moving into your future. The one thing I do, I forget those things behind, I reach forward to those things that are ahead. All these guys, Moses, and he goes, and he's not just these three, right throughout the Bible, all these guys have the same thing in common. Lousy starts, great finishes. Lousy beginnings, great endings. Their, their past never stopped the greatness of their tomorrow. Till I tell you today, it's never over until it's over. It's never done till it's finished. No doubt life throws some, some stuff our way. I, you know, I've been around long enough to know that, that pain is inevitable. It's misery that's optional. You will get disappointed. As a matter of fact, if you've not been hurt in life, you need to get out more. Because uh, the truth is, pain is inevitable. It's going to happen. It's, life's going to throw some really low blows at you. Life is not fair. We live on a fallen planet. There's no doubt uh, that, that, that we've got to understand things are going to come our way. Um, and, and the challenges and the storms and the injustice of life will be upon us. Then, as well as that, we have an enemy whose mission is to kill the plan of God, steal our joy and our, our inheritance and destroy the things that God has planned for us. There's an enemy out there. He wants to get you offended. He wants you to get disillusioned. And even if he can't get you offended or disillusioned, he wants you to be blasé. You know what? Often people think of religion as the stained glass window on the church down the road. Be assured, religion is what good people do when they lose their passion for God. Good people, they lose their passion, they, do, they go through the routine, they go through the ritual, but at the end of the day, if you're just a religious person, you're, you're out of the game, the, the, the enemy has sidelines you. Uh, 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 in church, somebody, I, and I speak to people all over the world that don't go to church, and I say, what, what's the problem? And they say, well, the church hurt me. And I say, what, the building jumped on you? No, no, they got hurt by somebody. They were disappointed. They, somebody let them down. I want to tell you, I tell you to get hurt at church, keep coming. Somebody, why don't we get it done today? Why don't we all get hurt in church today? I want you to turn to the person next to you on the left and slap them really hard in the face. I was just kidding, man. Leave your husband alone. It's just a joke. Leave him alone. Stop straight. No, it just said slap. Uh, we're going to get hurt. Pain is inevitable. Misery is optional. The plan of the enemy is to get you offended, disappointed, and disillusioned. Why? Then you're out of the game. And when you're out of the game, the game changes. It's important to realize that there's a plan to take you out of the game. I um, used to play rugby at high school, and uh, I don't think it was right, but I'll tell you how serious rugby was at my high school, that I was the fly half of the first 15 rugby team, and I wasn't allowed to get a detention. I ruled the school. I did some terrible things and they were supposed to suspend me. But they couldn't because football season was about to start. It was a very serious sport in our school. And I remember it was so serious that one of our strategies if we were playing a really good team, and I, you know, again, I'm not saying this is right, but this is how it was. I remember our coach saying to us, if they had a star player on the other side, he would tell us, he said, we need to hurt him so he comes off of the field. Don't put him in hospital, but hurt him so he can't play the game. 
His strategy was if you take the star player out, then the team's not going to function as well. And being a fly half, and I was their sort of key player for my team, I remember playing one team who had the same strategy. I remember in a rock, Andy, like one arm grabbed, this arm grabbed, I had nothing, and then smash right in the face, right there. Took me off, I was dazed for the rest of the game. Uh, there, was a, there was a sense of, or an understanding, that if you take your key players out, you've got a better chance of winning the game. The devil uses that exact strategy. If he can take you out, he doesn't have to kill you, he's just got to sideline you. He's just got to get you into religion, disappointment, hurt, offence, and those things, and now you're out of the game. Because without you, the game changes. Imagine if Moses had quit. I don't know if you've realised the uh, complexities of his job as being a deliverer. Three million Israelites, stubborn, angry, lack of faith, upset, aggressive, all sorts of things, man. They, They should have taken eight days to get to the promised land. It took them 40 years. Now understand this, as Moses, man, I'm not sure I would have lasted. He could have said, you know what, I quit. I've had, I've, I've had enough. I'm done. I'm done with this gang of people. But if he had quit, everything would have changed. Everything would have changed. Joseph, the pit, dysfunctional family, threw him in the pit. He's a sold into slavery, done nothing wrong. Um, then, then he's working for a, a, a Lord and the Lord's wife likes him and, uh, and says, come and uh, let's watch TV together. And, uh, and he, he refuses that. He is thrown in jail because he did the right thing, not the wrong thing. Be assured in life, the enemy will come against you when you do not just the wrong thing, but also the right thing. So we need to understand. But the reason is he wants to keep us out of the game. What if Joseph had quit? He said, I've had enough. God, where are you? I've done the right things. I've been accosted and offended. I've done all the right things. Then he would have never saved his future generation. Paul, what if he'd quit? <laughs> you know, we, look, we, we read Paul like he was this high-flying, traveling evangelist. But from what I can tell from Scripture, he spent most of his time in jail. Most of the things we read are written out of a jail cell. Wherever Paul ended up in a city, there was a new sign over the city, over, over the main street saying, welcome to our jails. Well, God, where, where, where's, where's the freedom? Where's, where's the justice in this? What if he had quit? You see, the reason things happen or the reason that we don't quit is because if we get on the sideline, the game changes. It will never be the same. And you know why the devil goes to so much trouble? He has more confidence in your calling than you do. He has more confidence in your potential, your possibility than you do. That's why he tries so hard, so hard to sideline us, to get us hurt, disappointed, upset, disillusioned, man, all those things. Why? Because he knows your potential and your possibility. So he throws the most he can at you. Our great challenge is not to let our past failures or our present challenges abort our future. It's our great challenge as a believer. The Bible says, when you've done all, stand. It says, pray until. There's no sense of give up, back down, because in our standing strong, we will see that. If you're going through hell, don't stop. Just keep going. It's never over till it's over. Some people are facing some situations here today. I'm speaking to you today. It's never over until it's over. God's got a plan. There's a purpose in this and you'll come through the other side. In Him, all things are possible. I want to read from 2 Kings chapter 7. It's a story of four lepers. Um, Their city is at war. The Syrians have surrounded them. They've cut off supplies. Now the city's out of food. They're starving to death. There's hardly any water left. The Syrians are just sitting back, waiting for them to go into chaos. Then they're about to attack again. You've got four lepers. (laughs) They're not welcome in the city. And the Syrian army doesn't care about them. So they're just at the gate in their own little world. We picked this up in verse 3. And it says this. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of this gate. And they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now therefore, come let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live. But if they kill us, we shall only die. 
So their whole conversation is about which way they're going to die. That's their high point of the day. That's, that's it. That, I mean, they have got the morale of a dying fish. I mean, they, they are so low that their decision-making process is not about the future so much as which way, do, which way will we die today? Which way will we go? You know, life can get so tough. We can get so blinded by our past or our present circumstances, we don't get a clear view of tomorrow. We can't see past where we are. We can't see past who we are. And therefore, we can't see the potential God has put in us. I want to tell you, there is good news today. God is not hand-tied by your circumstances. Everything you face has a name. Every disease has a name. Every financial situation has a name. Every predicament has a name. But the Bible says there's a name above every name, and that name is Jesus Christ. And they will bow its knee to the name that's above every name. So even though we're facing giants or dilemmas or wars or situations, we can get overwhelmed by what we see or we can get enthused by what we believe. And our believing makes an incredible distance. God's not tied by my circumstances. He doesn't wake up in the morning and look at me and go, gee, Mark, you're on your own. I don't know what to do with this one. He doesn't see through the eyes of impossibility. He knows that with him all things are possible. These four lepers, untouchable, in the midst of war and famine, blinded by their past, destroyed by their present, deciding which way they're going to die. You know, over the years of being a pastor, I've had meetings with people like that, that they've been so overwhelmed, they've seen no hope, no future. And sadly, some people stay stuck in that place and they never see the providence or the power of God in their lives. But others decide to believe what God says. And all of a sudden, their situations start to change because they start moving towards their giants. I'm going to tell you what these guys decided. They could have went back in the city, no food, they're going to die. Stayed where they are, no food, they're going to die. There's only one faith-filled option left. Let's go and face our giant. Let's face our enemy. The worst that can happen is we're going to die. But there's a possibility that we will live. And so what are these four to do? They said, you know what? We're going to start to move towards the giant that we face. Let's read what happens in verse 5 through verse 9. And the lepers, they, they rose at twilight and went to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, there was no one there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired against us the king of the Hittites and the king of the Egyptians to attack us, not having a clue what's going on. Therefore, and this is, the, this is the Syrians now, therefore the Syrians arose and fled at twilight. They left the camp intact. They left their tents there, their horses and their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent and they ate and they drank and they carried from it silver and gold and clothing. They went and hid them. They came back, hid at another tent, carried from there also. They went and hid all of that. Then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This is a day of good news, and we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. They made a decision to face their giant, not to move away from it, but to move toward it. Let's not quit, they said. Let's move towards the Syrian camp. Can I tell you this morning, you can write this down, but you, can, you want to remember this. Not quitting always gets God's attention. Not quitting always gets God's attention. When you decide not to give up, when you, you've been knocked down and you stand back up again. God is a God of resurrection. He loves it when people get knocked down. He brings them back to life. If we decide not to stay, nothing upsets a graveyard more than a resurrection. And nothing upsets the devil more than somebody that should have stayed down who decided to get back up. It declares the power of God in an awesome, awesome way. Not quitting always gets God's attention. The lepers were moving towards the Syrians. <laughs> four of them. Four of them. Somehow they catch the attention of their God. 
And I don't know what happens in heaven. And maybe there's a conversation between uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God says, well, they're moving in the right direction. And Jesus says, yeah, but there's only four of them. And the Holy Spirit says, maybe we should do something to help them. Maybe we should set something up. So what does God do? He sets up the biggest sound system in the world. In every cloud, there is a giant speaker. And it's pointed towards the Syrian camp. And every time those Syrians, I mean those lepers, shuffle towards their dilemma, their situation, every time their gravel scraped on the ground there, God amplified it so much that the Syrians thought it was the largest army in the entire history of humankind coming to attack them. They were that scared. They didn't take their horses, their donkeys. Their, they just get up and they leave. I want to tell you today, if you start moving towards your enemy, not away from it, God's going to do something. He's going to step in. Something's going to happen. Something's going to move out of your way. They lived. <laughs> they lived. They, 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 they were the ones unknowingly that saved their city from their enemies. Their town survived. Great wealth was obtained. The lepers became heroes. God had not passed them by. I want to tell you today, when you decide to move, not stand still, when you decide to move and keep moving, the hand of God will eventually come through and change that circumstance you're facing. They could have stopped, could have given up, gone back to nothing, but they didn't. And God overrode their past and their present and took them into an exceedingly abundant future. This is always the plan of God for every believer that through our mess becomes our message, through our test becomes our testimony and there's a plan of God at the end of it to bring greatness around our lives. Look what it says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him, God, who is able to do what? Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. The God that can do exceedingly abundantly. And that power works as long as we're moving forward. It works as long as we're believing Him. It works as long as we're going the right direction. If we stop, if we give up, if we fall back, we lose the potential of that scripture right there. Don't allow your past or your present to destroy or abort your exceedingly abundant future. We so, <laughs> we so easily... Um, put limitations or restrictions around our lives. You know what we do? We base our future on our experience. We base our future on what has happened to us, who we are. Or we base our future on the situation right now. Well, I've, I'm, I'm not, I can't beat, I'm not done that. Or we look back and, uh, the, you know, you don't understand where I've come from, Mark. You don't understand what I've been through. I'm not that person. And so we, we base our future looking at those things. It's so easy to put limits and restrictions around our lives based on our experience. What has happened in the past or what are we facing right, right now? We let what is chain us up. We let what was chain us up. It stops us. Your what was and your what is change you up. Listen, what is is nowhere near as powerful as the God that lives inside of you. What was is nowhere near as powerful as the God that lives inside of you. I was in um, Papua New Guinea a number of years ago. I was up there preaching and uh, had some time off. So I went to the uh, Port Moresby Zoo. <laughs> and it's a whole different experience to an Australian zoo. There's no workplace health and safety. There are no rules. I remember looking at this uh, five-metre crocodile. He was in a cage. Listen, the cage was made out of star pickets and chicken wire. Five meter crocodile, star pickets, chicken wire. That crocodile could have torn that down in a matter of seconds. But he never did. You know why? Because he grew up in that chicken wire since he was a small crocodile. And as far as he could tell, he couldn't beat that thing. He let his what was and his what is determine his future. It put restrictions around his life that he couldn't deal with. I want to tell you today, we need to make sure that we're not the same as that crocodile letting the what was and the what is determine the future God has for us. And it's not a, it's, they're not real restrictions. It's not real. It seems real, but it's not real. I'm looking at that croc. He's a massive croc. Biggest croc I've ever seen. Looking at him and going, almost willing him to break through. 
just get, not now, but get free later. <laughs> and as I was doing that, I, a couple of teenagers come up with a couple of sticks and started poking him <laughs> in the eyes. <laughs> That's when I stood back. I think this could be the day. I thought that croc gets angry enough, he'll tear down those restrictions. Maybe something's got to shift in you today, say, enough is enough. I'm not staying where I am. I'm not being controlled by what was or what is because that's not real. My future is unmistakably different because God is with me. We need to break free of our bonsai mindsets and allow God to stir his potential and power inside of us. If you get angry enough sometimes, (laughs) if you just get fed up enough sometimes, Those things that have kept you there won't hold you bound anymore. With God, your yesterday, your what is, don't have to decide your tomorrow. Your power is in what you believe today, not the the reality that you're dealing with, not the circumstances around you. So here's three key things as I finish this morning on that will help you deal with what is and what was to move into the potential and the power you have. Number one, forgive everybody of everything. Forgive everybody of everything. Forgive everybody. A lot of people get stuck on forgiveness because they want to forgive, but they can't. And the reason they can't is because they don't feel the person they forgive deserves it. And that's why it's so hard to forgive. How can I forgive that person that sexually abused me? How can I forgive that father that that abused me all my life? Uh, He doesn't deserve forgiveness, and he doesn't. You're right. That's not the issue here. Forgiveness is not about setting that person free. Forgiveness is about setting this person free. So when you forgive, you're taking off those restrictions, that that hurt, that disappointment. Offence becomes a fence. Offence becomes a fence and it holds you back. That's why the Bible is very clear on forgiving everybody. It doesn't matter what it is, whether they deserve it or not, it's not the point. We need to make sure for our own personal strength, we forgive everybody of everything. You must get good at this. Somebody will offend you. Somebody will disappoint you. And if you don't deal with it, it'll push you out of the game and the game will change. Get good at dealing with offence. Second thing, don't give in or give up. Don't give in. No matter how tough it gets, how bad it looks, don't give in or give up. It's never over (laughs) until there's too many testimonies, there's too many stories, there's too many living people that should have been dead. Don't give up. Keep going. I live on the principle of this. If you can run fast, run fast. If you can't run fast, run slow. If you can't run slow, walk fast. If you can't walk fast, walk slow. If you can't walk slow, crawl. Just keep moving. Don't stop. Just keep moving. In the things of God, in the situations you face, just don't lie down. Those lepers had to make a decision. Do we just lie here and suck it up and die? Or do we keep moving? And in their movement, it caught the attention of God and a miracle took place. If you can't run fast, run slow. If you can't walk fast, walk slow. If you can't walk slow, keep crawling in the things of God, but just keep moving inch by inch by inch. Don't give up. Don't give way. Don't give in. And the last thing this morning, shelve the excuses. Shelve, even, even if they're real, <laughs> even if it's a real reason, shelve the excuses. You know what an excuse does? Well, Pastor Mark, you don't know, you don't understand, you, but, but Pastor Mark, but I, I can't, no, 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 no. It all might be true and real, but the point is, every time you live through an excuse, it devoids you of any personal responsibility to change. As soon as you excuse, you become the victim. Well, I, I would have done better, I would have done different, but, but, but this or that or this or the devil or did this, whatever it was, but every time you do that, you put yourself in a victim mentality. Man, I want to tell you, shelve the excuses, Take personal responsibility for who you are, whether it's true or not, doesn't matter, and suck it up. It'll make you a stronger and greater person. Whatever you blame, you give power to. Whatever you blame. If you give blame to the devil, what you're saying is that he has more power than the Jesus that lives inside of you. If you blame your past, 
What you're saying is your future doesn't have the power to change your past. Whatever you blame, you blame your predicament, your race, your colour, your creed, your background, your po the politics of today. Whatever you blame, what you're saying is they are more powerful than the God we serve. Gentlemen, never blame your wives. They already have enough power. <laughs> Whatever you blame, you give power to. Don't blame. Shelve the excuses. Really, it's time for the church to come out of the closet. Everybody else has. Everybody else has. We're the only ones left in the closet. We need to stand up and declare the goodness of God. I was just in South Africa, Pastor Joel and Savannah, about to have their baby in two weeks' time. And it's real. She actually has a bump now. For a long time, the baby was standing straight up. There was no bump. But it's now dropped down to a special position. And uh, I spoke last Sunday night in a church in Bloemfontein, a church of 40,000 people. There are some incredible things happening around the world. And as I looked at the church of that big, I thought we need to pick our game up here in Australia a little bit, start to be that place. But I know this, I listen to the news and man, whether it be Korea, can you believe the, way, the days that we live in? In the most dilemmical, if that's a word, situations. And both men have bad hair. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> it's like a scene out of a bad movie. With all that money, you think both of them will get their hair done. <laughs> but I don't know what's going to happen with North Korea. I don't know what's going to... I was speaking to a British politician when I was in England about a month ago, and I said, he's got to be stupid. He, he doesn't even know that if he annoys America, they can, they can wipe them off the face of the earth in maybe two minutes. I mean, their power, they're flat out getting a ballistic missile out of Japan and America has enough power to destroy and wipe out. And I said, doesn't he see that? He says, Mark, I understand um, this man's predicament. He said, ever since he was a small boy, he's been worshipped as a God. And he says, as a God, he doesn't believe he's invincible. He does not see the possibility of being beaten because he is a God. So you've got a man that cannot see rationally about life and at the cost of everything. Who knows where it's going to end up? You know, I'm not saying we're going to war. I don't know of that. But I'm just saying the world's changing. We live in an age where everybody is not confident about the future. There's fear wrangling here, this over there, this here. And I want to tell you right now, never has there been a time for the church to stand up and say there's a hope, there's a future, there's Jesus Christ. Whether we go to war or not go to war, He is our way forward. The people need to be saved. They need to know the good news. They need good news. It's time to come out of the closet. Let's be proud of who we are. We're believers in the Son of God the answer, the Messiah, the Saviour of mankind. It's never over until it's over.